So this morning we are going to cover parts of chapter 8. We are definitely not doing the entire chapter. So just stick to the stuff that we're covering when you go read the textbook and get ready for your second exam. In lab we're going to play with some enzymes. So this chapter is about energy. It's also about enzymes. And this is the beginning of our section on biochemistry. So after this we're going to be looking at photosynthesis and then cellular respiration. So here are the major topics that we're going to cover out of chapter 8. We're going to look at how energy flows through living things and living systems. We're going to take a quick peek at the two laws of thermodynamics, look at this free energy, activation energy. But the really important stuff out of this chapter that you need to know, that you need to understand for the next two, structure and function of enzymes and also the structure and function of ATP because our next two chapters are going to be biochemical pathways that use a whole bunch of enzymes that turn one particular molecule into something else that we call the end product. So we already covered this, and this is something that you probably already knew, right? Energy is the ability to do work. It is not the act of doing anything. It's just the ability to get something done. That's basically the definition of energy. And there's two different types of energy. 
energy that's currently being used or energy in motion, which would be like the light coming out of these light bulbs. And then we have potential energy, which is energy that an object stores because of where it is, where, it, you know, its position. The further something has to fall, the more potential energy it has, because as objects fall, they gain velocity or they gain speed. So when they finally strike ground zero, they strike with more force. So for example, if somebody were to hold a brick about a half inch above your little piggy toes and drop the brick on your toes from a half inch high, is that really gonna hurt that bad? It could be annoying, right? You might get a little scrape, might ruin your little pedicure, but it's really not gonna hurt because the brick only had a half inch to fall, did not gain a lot of speed, so when it strikes your foot, it really doesn't have a lot of energy. But if somebody's up in the ceiling and drops a brick from there, it has a great distance to fall, about 12 feet. So by the time it hits your foot, it hits with a lot of force. So those are the two different types of energy. Thermodynamics is the, it's a study of changes in heat. Thermo means heat, right? And dynamic means changing or ever changing. So thermodynamics is actually a branch of science where we study changes in energy or changes in heat. A calorie, the technical definition of a calorie is how much heat is required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree centigrade. A gram is about what a medium sized paper clip weighs. So we're not talking about a whole lot of water, just a little tiny bit, how much heat does it take for that temperature of that one gram of water to go up by one degree centigrade. And what we're used to with a calorie, when you look at like the nutritional content on food packaging, that's really a kilocalorie. It's a thousand calorie. So if you look at it closely, a lot of times they'll write a K and then CAL, shorthand for kilocalorie. Oxidation and reduction, we already covered as well, but here's a reminder. Oxidation is the removal of an electron. Reduction is the addition of an electron. And these reactions always, always happen together. So we often refer to these reactions as redox. If one molecule or atom loses an electron, somebody else has to pick it up. There's something called the law of conservation of matter which means we can't create matter and we can't destroy it. All we can do is move it from one place to another or change its form, but you can't create energy and you also can't destroy it, or you can't create matter and you also can't destroy it. So if I'm an atom and one of my electrons flies out of orbit, it's not just gonna fly into a parallel universe or disappear into a black hole. That electron has to go somewhere. So if I lose an electron, if I am oxidized, somebody really close by is gonna wind up being reduced immediately as they receive that electron. When it's trash night in your neighborhood, everybody wheels their trash and their recycling down to the curb, right? You come back the next day and your trash is gone. Where did it go? Did it disappear? Did it fly off into a black hole somewhere? Or did those people come by early in the morning on that big truck they grabbed your trash and they dumped it in a big hole in the ground called a landfill, but it went somewhere. So if I lose an electron, if I put out an electron, somebody else has to pick it up and you'll pick it up immediately. So that's why we call these reactions redox. All of the reactions, pretty much every reaction we're looking at in the next two chapters is a redox reaction. We're gonna be passing electrons from one molecule to another molecule. So it's important that you understand that if somebody gives up an electron, somebody else is gonna pick it up immediately. And again, that's why we call oxidation reduction reactions redox, because that indicates that they always happen together. So the first law of thermodynamics is very similar to the law of conservation of matter. We can't create energy. All we can do is change its form from one form to another form. You can't create it, you can't destroy it like at our power plants. We get over half of our electrical energy from coal fire power plants that are to the west and to the south of us, Pennsylvania, West Virginia in particular. What they do in a coal fire power plant is they dig coal up out of the ground, 
they pulverize it into a fine dust, and then they lay it at the bottom of the power plant and burn it at a really high temperature. Above the burning coal, there's a lot of pipes that are carrying water. The heat from the burning coal vaporizes the water, boils it and turns it into a vapor, which then passes by a turbine that spins and that's what generates the electricity. So they're not actually creating any energy. They're taking the potential energy in coal. That potential energy is in the form of chemical bonds in the hydrocarbons that make up that coal. And when they burn it, they're turning water into steam, which then turns a turbine and it generates the electricity. So we go from potential energy to kinetic energy when we transform coal energy into electrical energy. But here's the thing, every time you convert energy into one form or the other, you're always gonna lose some of that energy as heat. And unless heat is a really, really high temperature, you really can't use heat to get anything done. It's a type of energy that's very dispersed and very disorganized. So unless it's a really high temperature, hundreds or thousands of degrees, we really can't use heat energy to get any biological work done. Like when you burn a regular, does anybody have those regular incandescent old fashioned light bulbs in their house? Remember those things, regular light bulb? You have the light bulb on for like an hour. The last thing you wanna do is touch it because it heats up so fast because those old fashioned light bulbs, they take some of the electrical energy and convert it into light energy, but most of that energy gets lost as heat. Those old fashioned light bulbs are only about 6% efficient, which means they only take about 6% of the electricity that you're paying for and turning that into light and the rest is being lost as heat. So that's why a lot of buildings over the last 30, 40 years put in these fluorescent light bulbs because they're much more efficient. And even more efficient than a fluorescent light bulb will be the LED light bulbs that take a lot of that electrical energy and turn most of it into light. But every time we convert energy from one form to the other, we're always gonna lose at least a little bit of that energy as heat. Again, heat is a very disorganized, dispersed form of energy and it's basically the random motion of molecules. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules move. The lower the temperature, the slower those molecules move. But if you have printed out this PowerPoint or you have it in front of you, you might wanna highlight this part. During each con uh, conversion, some of the energy is lost as heat. That's one thing I'm hoping you're gonna see when we cover chapter 10 on photosynthesis starting later this week and also chapter nine, which is cellular respiration. These are very efficient energy transformations that we're gonna be looking at, but not all of the energy is gonna make it in the end. Some's gonna be lost as heat. Yes, ma'am. This is chapter eight. And again, only parts of it. We're definitely not covering the whole chapter. We'd be here for a month if we did. So the first law of thermodynamics says, you can't create or destroy energy. We can only convert it from one form to the other. And the second law of thermodynamics basically says, every time you do that, you are contributing to the disorder or the entropy in the universe. Because we're gonna be taking concentrated energy like sunlight energy, converting it into something else where we lose some heat. Sunlight energy is very concentrated. It's also very organized. So we call it a high quality source of energy. But when we use that sunlight, like during photosynthesis, to make molecules of glucose, we're always going to lose some of that energy from the sun as heat. And again, heat is way too random, too dispersed to be used for any sort of biological work. So as energy is converted from one form to the other, some of that energy is lost as heat. And again, that heat is basically useless when it comes to biological systems. <clears throat> Now, free energy refers to how much energy a cell actually has available in order to get some work done, chemical work, transport work, or whatever. Most cells typically don't have a lot of this free energy stuff. Try to think of the energy of a cell as sort of like the money that we all have. Is anybody in here a, an independent multimillionaire? Have so much money you don't know what to do with yourself? Or 
are we all pretty much on some sort of budget, right? And when we wanna buy something big, we typically have to save for it, wait for it to go on sale. We have a limited supply of cash. We don't walk around just throwing 20s at people walking down the sidewalk, right? Cells are just like that with their money. They're on an energy budget. They don't have a lot of it just sitting around. They usually have a limited supply and they're only gonna use that energy when they absolutely need to. Free energy refers to the amount of energy that a cell actually has to start chemical reactions, to break chemical bonds so we can make new chemical bonds. The cells typically don't have enough free energy to get their own chemical reactions started. This is one reason or the main reason why we need these little proteins called enzymes. And again, that's one of the major topics out of that, this chapter, and it's also the topic of our lab today. <clears throat> In order for any chemical reaction to happen, the very first step is you have to bring the reactants together, the atoms or the molecules <clears throat> that are gonna have a chemical reaction. You have to bring them together. Like if we're trying to make carbon dioxide gas, but all of the carbon is on one side of the room and all the oxygen is on the other side of the room. Our first logical step to make carbon dioxide is we've got to bring those atoms together. But when you bring them together, they have to be traveling towards each other with enough speed so when they collide into each other, they have enough energy to stick instead of just bounce off of each other. So in order for a chemical collision, atoms or molecules that are bumping into each other, in order for that to result in a chemical reaction, the first requirement we have to meet is those particles have to be traveling towards each other with enough speed and energy so when they hit each other or collide, they're gonna stick together and react instead of bounce off each other and not react. And at the same time, our particles are moving towards each other fast enough. When they collide, they have to hit each other right where they're both chemically reactive. They have to hit just right. And that's what I mean by the configuration of the particles. Like if my fists were the particles and they're reactive right where my thumbs are, they have to hit dead on. Even if they're traveling three times faster than they need to stick, if they don't hit exactly just right, they're still gonna bounce off of each other. Those are two pretty tough requirements. Having to travel towards each other fast enough and then hit exactly just right. Those are pretty tough requirements for a chemical reaction to happen. But the third one, when we're inside of the cell, is the most difficult requirement to meet. And that would be the cell having enough free energy to kickstart the chemical reaction. Again, a lot of chemical reactions need a little bit of energy in the beginning just to get them started. And typically that energy is needed to break an existing bond so that these molecules are motivated to make a new one. So we have to meet all three of these requirements at the same time. Chemical reactions inside of a cell do not go fast enough spontaneously or on their own to keep a cell alive or to keep an organism alive. Think about this for a second. Let's run down to McDonald's and get a Big Mac and then we'll seal it up in a vacuum bag and put it underneath a pie glass. How long do you think it's going to take for that Big Mac to liquefy by itself? Is it going to take one day? Is it going to take a week? It's probably going to take years, right, for that thing to liquefy by itself if we have it sealed up in a vacuum and there's no microbes or anything in there. Something like a Twinkie would probably last a thousand years because of all of the preservatives that it has. But when we go eat like a Big Mac, you start chewing it up with your teeth, which is chemically or mechanically breaking it down. We have enzymes in our mouth that start to break down the proteins, the starches, and also the lipids. And then we swallow that stuff. It gets softened in our stomach acid, dumped into your small intestine, where we dump in some more digestive enzymes. So we liquefy that Big Mac in a matter of hours because of the action of our enzymes. So this is why cells need enzymes. It helps us meet these three requirements. It speeds up our chemical reaction. There are two major ways we could speed up biological reactions inside of a cell 
so they would happen fast enough to keep a cell alive. One would be turn up the temperature because when the temperature goes up, particles move a whole lot faster. And since they're moving around faster, they're bumping into each other more frequently. So they're more likely to hit each other with enough speed in exactly the right spot for the chemical reaction to happen. And all of that heat can be used as activation energy. But here's the thing, the amount of heat that we would need to speed up chemical reactions so that they were happening fast enough to keep a cell alive is over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you think of any living thing that can withstand 800 degrees Fahrenheit for any sustained period of time? No, that would just totally almost incinerate a cell. The second way we could speed up these chemical reactions without using enzymes is to increase the pressure because as you pressurize the system, the same thing happens. Particles move a whole lot faster. They're bumping into each other all the time. So sooner rather than later, they'll hit each other just right. And all that pressure can also be used as activation energy. But the pressure we would need to speed up these chemical reactions enough would totally crush the cell in a nanosecond. So this is why we need enzymes. The major thing that enzymes do is they release the amount of energy that's needed to get the reaction started. We call that activation energy. The amount of free energy that the cell has to get the reaction started. You have to infuse a little bit of energy to destabilize the existing chemical bonds so that they will make new chemical bonds with each other. A catalyst would be any substance, anything, that speeds up a chemical reaction by lowering the, the amount of activation energy. In industry, we typically use metals as a catalyst. Like if you take some platinum and you pound it out into a really thin sheet and heat it up, chemical reactions will go about a million times faster on that heated up metal. But most metals are toxic to living things. So we don't have little pieces of metal in our cells to speed up chemical reactions. We have proteins that serve this purpose. Enzymes are often called biological catalysts because they do the same thing as other catalysts do. They speed up chemical reactions, but they're also not part of the reaction. So when the reaction is over, your enzyme is exactly the same as it was and you can just keep using it over and over and over again. The main way that enzymes work is they lower the amount of activation energy that the cell needs to put it well within the budget of the cell. It's sort of like this. Let's say your car just dies. There's no way to fix it. It's totaled. I hope it doesn't happen to you, but let's just say your car is just done. You go to the local dealership, you see this car you really, really love, the sticker price on that thing is $42,000. Do you have 42 grand in the bank right now? Can you borrow 42 grand from like your mom or something? I know I can't, right? Probably not. But let's say the dealer comes out and says, look, I know that sticker says 42 grand, but you look like such a nice person. I'm gonna cut you a break. I'll sell it to you for a hundred bucks. You got a hundred bucks? If you don't have a hundred bucks like right now, right? You might be able to borrow 25 from your mom, right? Go digging through the couch, find some change. You can scrape together a hundred dollars a whole lot more easily and quickly than you can scrape together 42 grand, right? So this is what enzymes are doing. They are lowering the amount of energy that's needed to start the chemical reaction to put it well within the energy budget of that cell. Again, Cells don't have a lot of energy just sitting around, like most of us don't have, you know, st stacks of cash sitting around. So let's say this chemical reaction needs this much energy of activation to get going. We have to infuse that much energy to destabilize or break some of these chemical bonds. But when you throw in an enzyme, then you only need a little tiny fraction of that amount of energy, and it puts it right within the energy budget of a cell, almost like you being able to buy a $42,000 car for only a hundred bucks. If you're waiting for a chemical reaction to happen by itself, like a protein just to spontaneously start to break down, you're gonna be waiting a seriously long time. But when you throw in an enzyme, 
it happens almost immediately because enzymes speed up chemical reactions by millions of times. The average enzyme speeds up a chemical reaction by 10 million times. And again, the main reason enzymes speed up these chemical reactions is because they're lowering how much energy is needed to start the reaction in the first place. ATP is the type of energy that virtually all living cells on this planet use for energy. ATP is short for adenosine triphosphate. This molecule is a very unstable nucleotide. It's very, very similar to RNA nucleotides, especially an adenine RNA nucleotide. <clears throat> we briefly looked at the structure of nucleic acids, just super fast, but they're made out of three parts. There is a sugar called ribose, which has five carbons in it. And then we have a base called adenine, a nitrogenous base. And to make an RNA nucleotide, we would add one phosphate functional group, and that would be an RNA nucleotide. The difference between that RNA nucleotide and ATP is there's three phosphate groups all bonded to each other in a chain instead of just having one but it is a very unstable nucleotide, very similar to one of the RNA nucleotides. Most of the energy in this molecule of ATP is stored in the chain of three phosphate groups. So here is the structure of ATP. Do not memorize this structure. There's no point, there's no value in memorizing the exact molecular structure of ATP. If you're somebody going on in science, if you're going on in biology, maybe when you take something like cell biology you would, or chemistry, biochemistry, you would have to remember this. But I just wanna show you the real structure and then we're gonna simplify it so we can concentrate on where the energy is, which is the most important thing. Here is the five carbon sugar called ribose. Five carbon means there's only five carbons in its carbon skeleton. There's calories, there's energy in sugar, right? Yeah, there is. If we were to break these bonds in this sugar, we would get some energy out. But that's not where the action is with ATP. Here's the nitrogenous base called adenine. This is a, a little molecule that's found in both DNA and RNA. These bonds are also storing energy. So if we broke those bonds, we would get the energy out of them. But that is not where the action is with ATP. The action is here in the chain of three phosphate groups. These dashed lines replicate or indicate a chemical bond. Remember, that's a shared pair of electrons. The bond between the first and the second phosphate group, it stores a little bit more energy than the average chemical bond. Some bonds just store more energy than other ones. The bond between the second and the third phosphate group, though, that one has a lot of energy in it. So this is primarily where we're storing the energy in ATP, the type of energy that cells use in order to get chemical work, transport work, mechanical work done so those cells can stay alive. This is one of those unifying um, themes in biology. All living things, with only the exception of these ancient prokaryotes that live in the sub-oceanic crust. Like if you go out in the middle of the ocean, go all the way to the bottom, drill down in the earth that's under the crust about four miles or so, you're gonna find some weird prokaryotes that evolved roughly 3.5 billion years ago that are using the intense heat that's by these sub-oceanic volcanoes as their source of energy to stay alive. And they're basically digesting volcanic glass. They don't use ATP for energy, they use something related called PEP. But besides that, everything else on this planet is using this particular molecule to store and to, and to release energy. All bacteria, all plants, all fungus, all protozoans, all animals, including us. On average, every single one of your cells is using 10 million molecules of ATP, not every day, not every hour, but every single second. That's an average between your muscle cells, which use a lot of energy, your fat cells, which don't use a lot of energy, and also averaging out the differences from when you're at rest and sleeping and when you're awake. But on average, 
your cells are using and also regenerating 10 million molecules of this ATP stuff. So let's just try to simplify this. So we can just look at where the action is. This is one of the things that's gonna come back to us when we get into the next two chapters. I really like to see handles on these things. It's kind of hard to pull. So here's the adenine. Even though adenine has a lot of chemical bonds in it that are storing energy, they're not the ones that are broken when ATP is used. So we're just gonna put an A there. There's the adenine nitrogenous base. And even though there's energy in sugars, if we broke the bonds in that ribose sugar, we get some energy. But again, that's not what happens when we use ATP. So we're just gonna put a circle around the A and say that's the ribose sugar. The action is in the chain of three phosphate groups. So the chemical bond holding the first phosphate group to the adenine and the ribose, it stores the average amount of energy. We're not gonna worry about the oxygens. We're just gonna put a P there. That stands for the entire phosphate functional group. The next bond has a little bit more energy than the first one. So if we were to break this bond, we would get more energy than if we were to break that bond. But that's still not where most of the energy is stored. Most of the energy of ATP is stored in the terminal or the last phosphate bond. The way we indicate a high energy bond is by drawing a squiggly line instead of a straight line. That means this is storing a ton of energy. If we break that bond, we're gonna get a ton of energy out of it. So when your cells need energy to do something, to maybe build a molecule of protein or to pump a molecule of glucose inside of the cytoplasm, what we're gonna do is use dehydration synthesis, right? add that molecule of water right to this bond. That's how we break them. And we're not gonna destroy the ATP. We're gonna convert it into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Di, because we now only have two phosphate groups. That third phosphate group, when we broke the bond, it just goes floating around in the cytoplasm. But the most important thing is we got the energy out in a form that the cell can use. Most cells on this planet have been engineered to run off of the raw chemical energy of sugars like glucose. Our cell, the cells of animals, the cells of most fungus, bacteria, plants, and so on, they use the raw chemical energy of glucose. But when a cell breaks down glucose, breaks the bonds in that sugar, the energy is released in a form that the cells cannot use. So what they'll do when the cell breaks down like a molecule of glucose, when the energy is released, our chemical reaction is gonna go backwards. It's gonna go in the other direction. We're gonna take that energy that was just released when we broke down glucose, and we're gonna trap that energy in the terminal phosphate bond of ATP, and we regenerated our ATP. And then the cell needs some energy to get something done. So now our chemical reaction goes that way. We're gonna hydrolyze that terminal phosphate bond, release the energy, create the ADP and the free phosphate group, and now the cell has energy that it needs to get something done. And now we break down another molecule of glucose. The energy comes out, but it's not in the form that the cell can use, so our chemical reaction goes backwards again. We take that energy, we grab a phosphate group and an ADP, and we trap that energy that was just released from that glucose right back in this terminal phosphate bond of ATP. And then the cell needs some energy to do something. Maybe it needs to make a sugar. So now the reaction goes in the opposite direction. Hydrolyze that terminal phosphate bond, release the energy, create the ADP in the phosphate group. And now we break down another sugar. The energy gets released, but it's not in the right form for the cell to use. So we go backwards again. We grab the energy, we grab the phosphate group and the ADP and trap that energy that was just released from the sugar in that terminal phosphate bond. And then the cell needs energy to do something. Do we, we, you get the idea, right? It's storing and transmitting energy that the cells can use. The relationship cells have with glucose and ATP is very similar to the relationship your car has with crude oil and gasoline. If you were to take some crude oil, that thick, gooey black stuff, and put it in your gas tank, is your car gonna work? No, you're gonna clog all your fuel injectors and make a whole lot of other problems for your car. But what we do is we take that crude oil, 
we take it to a refinery, we've got a bunch of them along the Delaware River, and what they do is they separate out the part that we call gasoline. It's derived from the oil. In particular, they're trying to separate out that octane, that hydrocarbon. And now you put that in your gas tank and your car has the energy it needs to work. So for your cells, the glucose is kind of like the crude oil. It's the raw source of energy for your cells, but it's not the right form that your cell can use. So it's kind of like the oil. ATP is like the gasoline for your cell. It's the right form of energy that cells can use. So these reactions go forwards and backwards. We don't destroy the ATP when we use it. We're just converting it into ADP and releasing that phosphate group. When you're reading through the chapter, there is a section that says sometimes, and actually pretty frequently, we will, we will hydrolyze the third phosphate bond and also the second phosphate bond, which creates a MP, adenosine monophosphate. But typically the reaction is just breaking the terminal phosphate bond because that has a whole lot more energy than this one. Make sense? Perfect. Next two chapters are going to be all about ATP, storing energy and transmitting energy. All right, so again, enzymes, these are biological catalysts made out of protein that speed up chemical reactions in living things, living unicellular organisms like a single cell bacterium, and also a multicellular organism like a big tree or a person or a pig. The unique three-dimensional shape of an enzyme determines what particular chemical reaction it's going to speed up. Form always fits function. So the form or the shape of the enzyme determines which chemical reaction is going to mediate or speed up. Enzymes can only do one thing. They can only speed up one chemical reaction. So there's enzymes out there that grab oxygen and hydrogen, slap them together, make water, release it. Then they grab more oxygen and hydrogen, slap them together, make more water and release it. That's all they do. They can't even take that molecule of water and break it apart into hydrogen and oxygen. That's the job of a completely different enzyme. Which specific chemical reaction the enzyme mediates or speeds up is totally determined by its three-dimensional shape. Now I'm using the language in your textbook, but here I'm trying to paraphrase or put it into more basic English. The unique shape or three-dimensional shape of the enzyme enables that enzyme to stabilize a temporary association between substrates. Okay, yeah, that's right. But an easier way to think of it is the shape of an enzyme determines which chemical reaction it's going to speed up. And because the enzyme is not part of the reaction, when the reaction is over, the enzyme releases its end products and it's exactly the same as it was before the chemical reaction. So these things are reusable. We reuse enzymes millions and millions and millions of times before they become damaged and have to be recycled. But enzymes, they're not part of the reaction, so they're not changed by the reaction. They are not used up by the reaction. They're left exactly how they were before the reaction started. And because their major job is to reduce the amount of activation energy, you only need a little bit of energy from the cell in order to get whatever chemical work or mechanical work done. The molecule that attaches itself to an enzyme and gets converted into something else, we call that the substrate. So let's say this little purple enzyme down here, the purple thing is supposed to be an enzyme. Let's say that's the enzyme lactase. That is an enzyme that we produce in our digestive system that breaks down lactose, the sugar that's found in milk and other dairy products. The substrate here, the yellow thing, that's lactose. That's the sugar that's found in milk. Look at the shape, this little cutout shape on the enzyme. That's called the active site. This is where the substrate molecule attaches itself to the enzyme and the chemical reaction happens. So this molecule of sugar, our lactose, goes into the active site of our enzyme lactase and look what the enzyme's doing. It's breaking the bond between this double sugar, this disaccharide, 
and it's releasing two simple sugars or two monosaccharides. So this is a digestive enzyme or a catabolic enzyme because we're breaking this molecule down. When we break that bond between those two sugars, it releases energy. The cell is gonna take that energy and trap it in the terminal phosphate bond of ATP. And that molecule of ATP will later be used as a source of usable energy for the cell. Some enzymes have one active site, like you see on this little purple one. Some have three, some have 17. It's just a difference between enzymes. Enzymes themselves always end in the suffix ASE, like the enzyme I just mentioned, lactase. The name of the enzyme usually either names its substrate, like the enzyme lactase, it breaks down lactose, but other enzymes, the name will tell you the name of the chemical reaction. So we're gonna see both when we get into our next chapter. Some enzymes that are named for the substrate they work on, like lactase working on lactose, and other ones just name the chemical reaction. But most enzymes, they are not loners. They don't work all by themselves. They're part of an assembly line, a multi-enzyme complex, where you have one enzyme in the beginning that grabs the initial substrate, changes it a little bit, and then passes it off to the second enzyme, which puts that intermediate substrate into its own active site, and changes it a little bit more, and then passes it on to the third enzyme, who puts it into its active site, changes it a little bit more, passes it off to the next enzyme, and so on down the line, until we reach the last enzyme in the assembly line, which takes that initial substrate, does the last chemical change to it, and releases the end product. So when we use a bunch of enzymes in an orderly series like that, that's called a pathway. A pathway in biology is an orderly series of chemical reactions that are being carried out by enzymes. Photosynthesis is a biochemical pathway, and that's what we're talking about on Thursday. And then next week, we're gonna cover cellular respiration, more biochemical pathways. We're gonna be looking at a series of enzymes that takes a substrate, passes it from one enzyme to the next and to the next until you wind up with the end product that you want, the final end product. Now we don't want our enzymes working at full blast all the time, because even though they are making molecules that the cell absolutely needs, you can have too much of a good thing, right? You've heard that saying before, you can have too much of a good thing. Vitamin C is really good for you, right? You can actually OD on vitamin C if you consume too much at the same time. Same thing with vitamin A. That's a great vitamin, it helps your eyeballs work. But you can actually overdose on vitamin A if you drink too much carrot juice, for example. Some people have actually, they've actually died from drinking too much carrot juice at one time. This is not something that a lot of people drink in the United States, but other parts of the world, they really enjoy that. But if you sit there and drink like four gallons of, of carrot juice all at once, you're getting concentrated vitamin A, you can get really sick from that. So the cell needs whatever end products these are. But if you have too much of them, it could build up to a toxic level and actually damage or destroy the cell. But you have to have enough for the cell to function properly. So we have to maintain the concentration of these end products to keep them within a, a, a level that's compatible with life. This is one thing that cells do that non-living things don't do. If I can fit it on this board. It's called homeostasis. If that is a word you've never heard of before, homeostasis means maintaining a relatively constant internal environment. Living things do that, non-living things don't. Here's a quick example. What must our body temperature be for it to work properly? What is the regular body temperature of a human? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Some people run a little bit cooler than that, some a little bit hotter than that, but the average body temperature for a human is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Have you ever run a fever of like 103, 104? How do you feel? Feel pretty crappy, right? You're tired, you don't feel like doing anything. People start to hallucinate sometimes when their body temperature is 104. That's because we deviated from this homeostatic set point where our temperature is supposed to be 98.5. 
or 98.6. You can survive a temperature of 104, 105 as long as you don't maintain it for a really long time. Has anybody had their body temperature drop below 98.6? No hypothermia? I'm the only one? I went to Iceland for the first time in August, long, long time ago, and I was on a tour bus. We saw this big waterfall that's like an hour inland. It's called Golfos. And our tour guide told us this thing completely freezes over in the winter because it's so cold. This waterfall is the size of Niagara Falls. So I grabbed my niece when she was 15 and her girlfriend, and we flew back in January, grabbed that tour guide who I was now friends with. We drove inland, you know, when you're right along the coastline in the capital city of Iceland. It was like 43 degrees that morning. But when we drove an hour inland and you get away from the ocean with the heat coming out of the ocean, it was about negative 15 degrees. And then it was really windy. So our, our final wind chill temperature was like negative 30. This guy locked the keys in the truck. We were locked out of the car. So all we could do was like we called a cell phone. We're in the middle of nowhere, Iceland, right? They had to send a helicopter to get to us fast enough. So we're all walking around the car trying to keep our body temperature up. So I can tell you, if your body temperature drops too low, you also feel pretty cruddy because we deviated from that homeostatic set point. Here's another one, your blood sugar. We have to maintain our blood sugar within a range that our body's able to work correctly. If you have too much blood sugar, it interferes with a lot of bodily functions and we call that diabetes, right? If you don't treat diabetes and get that blood sugar lower, you run the risk of you know, getting peripheral neuropathies, like a burning sensation in your feet, you can go blind, you can get liver damage. If your blood sugar drops too low, you run out of energy and a lot of people pass out. So we gotta maintain it within a concentration or a level that's compatible with life. It's the same thing with these inhibitors. We don't want our enzymes working at full blast, kicking out these end products at full speed all the time because we'll make too much of them and we'll deviate from that homeostatic range. That's not compatible with life. So these inhibitors are not necessarily bad things. Sometimes what they're doing is they're slowing down our enzymes. So they're not producing too much of the end product, but producing enough that'll keep the cell alive. There's two different types of inhibitors. Those that go into the active site and block the substrate, we call those competitive inhibitors. And then we have sneakier ones that stick to somewhere else on that enzyme and stop it from working. This is called non-competitive or allosteric inhibition. So here's the real substrate, right? These two things, you can see this piece is perfect for fitting into that active site. And this piece right there is perfect for fitting into that active site. But here we have something that is not the real substrate. This is a different molecule that has a different shape, but it has this piece right here that fits perfect into that active site. So if this molecule, this inhibitor, gets to the enzyme first and gets into that active site, it just sits there and blocks the substrate. No chemical reaction happens to that inhibitor. It just sits there like a blocker. But a lot of these competitive inhibitors, they'll stick to the enzyme for a little while and then eventually they'll go away. And when they go away, now the substrates can get in there and the enzyme starts working. So it's not destroying the enzyme, it's slowing them down so they don't kick out too much of that end product. It's called competitive inhibition because the substrates and the inhibitor are in competition for who's going to get into that active site first. So if the inhibitor gets in there first, it just blocks the substrate but a lot of those inhibitors are reversible, which means they will eventually leave the enzyme, the enzyme starts working. Some of them are irreversible, which means they're gonna to stick to that enzyme and never leave. And if that happens, this enzyme will never work again. So there's reversible inhibition when the inhibitor just is there for a little while, and then there's irreversible when it's there forever. This is a little bit sneakier. There is another site on an enzyme that's not the active site. The substrate doesn't stick to it. It's called the allosteric site, which is right here. So when there's nothing in the allosteric site, look at the shape of the active site. It's perfect for this substrate to go right in there and undergo a chemical reaction. But this inhibitor sticks to the allosteric site and look what happens to the shape of the active site. It changes so it's not the right shape, 
and the substrate can't get in there. So the, the end result is the same. It blocks the substrate. These allosteric or non-competitive inhibitors are also either reversible or irreversible. Many of these competi non-competitive inhibitors, they'll stick in the allosteric site, but eventually leave. And when the inhibitor leaves, the, allos or the active site goes right back to its regular shape and the enzyme starts working again. So again, these inhibitors are not necessarily bad thing. They're regulating our enzymes. So they're making enough of the end product, but not too much. Keeping that within a range that's compatible with life, just like our blood sugar and our body temperature. So an inhibitor, just to have it all typed up for you, is a substance that sticks to an enzyme and decreases its activity. Competitive inhibitors go into the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors go into the allosteric site instead. But the end result is exactly the same. The, you're blocking the substrate from getting in there and you're blocking those enzymes from, from working. An activator is the opposite. This is a substance that can bind to the allosteric site and it keeps the active site in the right configuration. So sometimes it works in the opposite. When, the, when that activator leaves, the active site changes and now the enzyme doesn't work. And I just kind of want to focus in on the inhibitors instead because that's what's going to be most important to us like in lab today and also in the next two chapters. Cofactors, these are parts of the enzyme that are not protein, that they, they determine the shape of that active site. Same thing with coenzymes. Coenzymes and cofactors are other little pieces of the enzyme that make sure that the active site is in the right shape. We just have a different name for if that other molecule is organic or not. If it's an inorganic molecule that's stuck to the enzyme and determining the shape of the active site, we call it a cofactor. And if it is an organic molecule, like a carbohydrate, then we just call it a coenzyme instead. Now, there are four major environmental factors that influence how fast enzymes are working. Let's go back to page two for a second. Those are temperature, pH, substrate concentration, and if there's any inhibitors around. Four major environmental factors that determine if our enzymes are going to work and if they are working, how fast are they working? The book does cover these topics, but I don't think in enough detail. And these are really kind of important, and this is also our lab today. We're gonna to be playing with some enzymes. So I think probably the easiest way to describe and digest this is if we just start to graph those environmental factors against enzymatic activity. So I'm just going to draw a little x, y axis. We will put enzyme activity over here on the y axis and temperature down here on the x. And both values are increasing. So the higher up we go on the y axis, the faster our enzymes are working. And the further out we go on the x axis, the higher the temperature is. When the temperature is really cold, how fast do chemical reactions happen? They happen fast or slow when it's cold? Slow. They happen really slow, right? Like if you put a packet of sugar in a glass of iced tea, you stir it for 10 minutes, you still see undissolved sugar swirling around on the bottom. But if you take that same packet of sugar and you dump it in a, a cup of hot tea, it dissolves almost immediately, right? Because that heat makes these molecules move around faster. So down here at the XY intercept where it's, the temperature is really cold, our enzymatic activity is going to be relatively low because the enzymes are cold. They're not moving around too fast. But as temperature increases, enzymatic activity starts to take off. It goes really, really, really fast. And then suddenly we reach a temperature where activity drops to zero and then stays at zero. What do you think happened to our little enzymes right up there where they dropped off in their activity? We're adding heat. This is so hard with masks. You're probably saying the right thing, but I, it's, I can't hear you. I also can't tell who's talking to me. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, absolutely. They, they denature. Remember those enzymes, they're proteins. 
and their three-dimensional shape is primarily held by hydrogen bonds. So just like when we took a raw egg and we threw it into a hot pan, those proteins unraveled and denatured and will never work again, that's what happened here. We reached a temperature that's so high, it broke the hydrogen bonds holding the shape of that enzyme and it denatured. So our activity drops all the way to zero. And even if we cool those enzymes down, they're denatured, they're not gonna roll back up. So this is known as the point of denaturation. What we're gonna to do today is, first thing, I'm gonna give you some enzymes. These are enzymes that are found in potato cells. And we're gonna put them in a little test tube, just like the one that we use for the uh, food nutrient lab. And then we're gonna give them their substrate. We've got a few drops of the molecules those enzymes work on. And you're gonna count how many seconds it takes for that chemical reaction to happen under normal conditions. The chemical reaction is indicated by a color change in your test tube. It's gonna turn from light tan to dark brown. So you just count how many tech seconds it takes. I believe our lab tech is probably right now or just a few minutes ago, extracted those enzymes for us. So that reaction should happen well under one minute, maybe 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds, depending on how fresh they are. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put them in an ice bath. We're gonna take the enzymes, put them in a test tube, stick them in an ice bath for a while to cool them down and then give them their substrate and count how many seconds it takes for the chemical reaction to happen. And you're gonna see it's gonna take a whole lot longer because the temperature is colder. And then we're gonna take some enzymes, put them in a test tube, throw them in a hot water bath and heat them up. And then we're gonna add the substrate and see, did we add enough heat to speed up the reaction and it happens faster? Or was there so much heat that it denatured the enzymes and the reaction's not gonna work? Another environmental factor we're gonna check out is the pH. So we're gonna draw another graph with pH down here on the X. pH goes from zero to 14. And we're gonna keep enzymatic activity over here on the Y. I cannot write this word. Remember seven is neutral. When you're below seven, you're in an acid. And when you're above seven, you're in a base. Living things are not very tolerant of changes in pH. Just like we don't wanna drink a big glass of sulfuric acid, right? Cause it would damage our throat. Living things can't tolerate those acids in general either. So most of our enzymes are only active right around a pH of seven. Remember most living things live within a narrow pH range between six and eight. And most of those are between 6.5 and 7.5. So if we were to graph enzymatic activity versus pH, we're gonna get some sort of bell curve. Where we don't see any activity where it's extremely acidic or basic, and we see a peak of activity where the pH is neutral at seven. Now that's just some random generalized enzyme. Some enzymes are not as tolerant of changes in pH. So if we were to graph those, we would see a more narrow peak at a pH of seven. But then of course there are exceptions like your digestive enzymes that are in your small intestine. You have a bunch of acid in your stomach and the pH is about two. It's about the pH of battery acid. Then your, the contents of your stomach open up into your small intestine. So the pH there is still really low. It's like a pH of two or three. We have enzymes that work in that acidic environment, little proteases that break down, proteins that we ate and so on. So for them, the ones that work in acids, like some of our digestive enzymes, we would see a peak of activity here instead, but it's always some sort of bell curve. Changes in pH also denature enzymes. So right where you see activity dropping off, that is a point of denaturation and different enzymes have different tolerances to acids and bases. So that's the effect of pH. The next one would be how much substrate is around? What is the concentration of substrate? So we're gonna put that down on the X and keep enzymatic activity on the Y. Oh, my seed look like teas today. The example I like to use for this is waiting tables. Anybody in here wait tables for a living or used to? 
waitresses, waiters? Live off. Okay, now we got a couple, yeah. I did that too. My first job was, you know where the Hollywood Diner is in Woodbury Heights? Nobody knows the Hollywood Diner? Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that used to be a steakhouse when I was a little kid. It was a rustler. I remember going there just barely with my parents. Then it closed down for a while. And then they opened it up as a sizzler when I was 16 years old. So I got working papers. That was my first waitressing job. And then I went to random crappy diners in the area. Wound up at the Friendlies in Glassboro, and then eventually at the Olive Garden in Denver. And it feels like I just wait, waitress like last year. It's something you don't forget, right? Most people don't realize, or a lot of people don't realize, when you show up for your shift, when you're a waiter or waitress, you just don't immediately start throwing food at people. We normally have some side work. So at the Olive Garden, we would have to roll the silverware like in that maroon linen. You had to bring out the ice, bring out the mugs, bring out the glasses. We'd set up the little salad bar in the back so we can whip up that big bowl of salad real fast. So let's say you show up for your shift, you got all your side work done, but there's nobody sitting at any of your tables. What would your level of activity be then? You're flirting with the bartender, right? You got nothing to do. There's no substrates for you. You have no customers sitting at your table. But let's say the host or hostess comes over and says, hey, I sat you a party of three right over there. What's your activity level now? Well, now you have a party of three sitting there. So now you have something to do, right? It's not a lot, but you got three people. There's something in the industry that we call the two minute rule. We try to time it to exactly two minutes after you sat down until we show up and say, okay, what do you want? Because if somebody, if your waiter or waitress follows you to the table and as soon as your butt hits the chair they say what you want you're going to feel rushed right and after about two minutes most people go where are they they suck i'm not going to leave a tip so we try to time it to two minutes but if you only have one table you can get all fancy in those two minutes right i would go get that little tray put the maroon linen on it get them some water with some lemon on the side roll up some breadsticks and then you show up by their table say hi my name is debbie welcome to the olive garden can i get you something to drink or an appetizer i try to get the check up to get your tip up so you're back there getting the drinks and the appetizers for your three top. And then you come out and you see you've been sat a party of six. So with three people, maybe your activity level is out here. But when they add a party of six, what's your activity level at this point? You bring out your appetizers and your beverages for your first table. You show up at your second table with your, your water and your breadsticks. You ask for their order. You get their order. You're coming back out with the salad and the soup for your first table. You got the drinks and the appetizers for your six top. And now you see that you have been sat another table so if you have six tables maybe you're here or six people on a table now you're here so you're coming out this time and now you see you've been sat three parties of four a party of ten and a party of nine what's your activity level now <laughs> we call that weeded and i hear that's still the term that we use in the industry the weeds are so high you don't know what size up where to go what you're doing next because that's way too many people for one person to wait on the Olive Garden, since there's free refills on pretty much everything, a station was only three tables. And if you could prove you could handle more, they would give you four. I know other restaurants, the diners I worked at, you'd have 10 tables to work, but all the free refills at the Olive Garden, they give us three or four. There's one night in the Olive Garden, I will never forget, we got a brand new manager. His name was Dominic, he was from the island of St. Thomas. Really great guy, but he didn't quite understand Monday night football around here, especially when it was the Eagles versus the Cowboys. So here we are with this new manager, Monday Night Football, Eagles, Cowboys, we know what's gonna happen, right? The servers, the cooks, the bus boys, we all know what's gonna happen. People are gonna be home watching that game. And then at halftime, believe it or not, a whole bunch of people run out and try to have dinner real fast and get back home for the second half of the football game. So we had hardly anybody in this restaurant at six o'clock at night. So Dominic starts to send people home. When you walk in the Olive Garden, you know you can go to this side or that side. In Deffert, this was known as the West. And when business declines, he closes that whole side of the restaurant. So 11 servers go home, half the cooks, half the busboys, half of the bartenders. So at like 6, 6.15, he shut down the West. And then he starts picking people off of the East. So by the time halftime hit, it was me and very short, extremely pregnant lady named Mary. She was almost ready to give birth. She was out to here. And suddenly the lobby fills up and Dominic allowed every single table on the east side to be filled up with people. You're supposed to have 11 servers there. There's me and Mary, every table filled up immediately. So instantly we were weeded, right? You could, this is the night I learned how to carry two big trays full of dinner for everybody out of necessity. You can't move fast enough to serve all those people, right? I had this one lady walk in 
she was mad when she walked in. I don't know if that was her husband or brother or cousin or whatever, but she was sitting there like this. She was just pissed and she walked in the door. And I'm walking by like this with an entourage of busboys behind me. We couldn't have the busboys take orders because they really didn't speak English. They were all from Bangladesh. So we had them bringing out water and breadsticks. And this lady, I didn't get to her fast enough. She picked up a breadstick and she winged it at me and she hit me in the back with it. All right, so I'm out of graduate school at this point. I have my master's degree and I'm back waitressing at the Olive Garden. And it's like the 10th month of looking for a job in the industry and still waitressing. You think I'm happy at this job at this point? <clears throat> no, not really. So I picked up the breadstick. I was aiming for her forehead, but I hit her in the neck, hit her right here. And I said, look, if you want to eat 15 minutes and get home, there's a McDonald's down the street. You can get up out of here and go to McDonald's. And I turned around, bumped right into Dominic. He was like right here, big man. I was like, oh shit, I just got fired, right? <laughs> so we went back in the kitchen. I thought I was gonna be fired. He said, don't do that again, but that was hilarious. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is, we can only work so fast, right? You reach a point where you're working as fast as you can, you can't work any faster. And if somebody throws a breadstick at you, is that gonna make you work any faster? Nope. Absolutely not. So here's our enzymes. They're working, they're getting faster, they're faster, faster, and then they reach this point where they're working as fast as they possibly can. Throwing more substrate at them is not gonna make them work any faster because they're already working as fast as they can. This point where activity levels off is the point of saturation. Your enzymes are saturated. As soon as they release the end product, another substrate immediately appears in that active site. And they're working as fast, as fast as they possibly, possibly can. So in lab today, we're gonna to take some enzymes, we're gonna stick them in an acid, let them sit there for a while, give them their substrate. We're gonna take some other enzymes, put them in a base, let them sit there for a while, put in the substrate. And we'll see if it slowed them down or if it sped them up. Then we're also going to add a few more drops of enzymes, see if that speeds up the chemical reaction. Then we're gonna add more substrate, see if that speeds up the chemical reaction. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we are going to add some inhibitors that inhibit these potato enzymes. So again, keeping enzymatic activity over here on the Y, here we're gonna put inhibitors. inhibitor concentration so the further out we go the more inhibitors we have now for this particular graph we can only draw something sort of generic so for an irreversible inhibitor that sticks to the enzyme forever we're going to see activity drop all the way to nothing so that would be irreversible if it's reversible then we're just going to slow the enzymes down. So our last experiment is we're going to get some enzymes. We're going to hit them with some inhibitors, let them sit there for a while. And then we're going to add in the substrate and just see if we have inhibited them reversibly because the chemical reaction just is slower than the first time we did it. Or did we add so many inhibitors and the, they're irreversible that enzymes aren't going to work anymore at all. They're not going to do anything. So here it is, 10 after 10. There's only a little bit left in this chapter, and that's fine. That'll be a perfect introduction to our next chapter, chapter 10. So we'll cut it off here. We'll pick it up there on Thursday, and I'll see you down in lab in about 10, 15 minutes.